Welcome back to React Native Radio Podcast. Brought to you by the iPhone 48, announced next Tuesday. Hold on, I'm being told. Yes, I can confirm. Google also has phones. Episode 274, React Native CI and Automated Deployments. I had a really annoying thing happen to me over the weekend. Actually, last week, I guess. I found out that my identity had been stolen. Wait, like for real? Like like really, really stolen? Like really stolen. Like they wow. had my social security number, which for those of you outside the U.S. is, uh, you've probably heard about it, but it's, it's a number that we get. It's the worst kept secret in the world. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and yet it's used as a password to do all kinds of things in your name. It's the worst system. I don't know. It's why like this, this number that like lets you do all these things. And yet they give it to you on like a literal piece of paper. And then you have to give <laughs> and you, it and, and never then let you, you have to it. like give it to everybody for everything. And you can never change it. Yeah. Great system. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thousands and thousands of people have my social security number legitimately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's no wonder that at some point it's going to get out. But it was it was more nefarious than that, though. So they actually signed up for a, a like a mail monitoring service that the U.S. Postal Office, U.S. Postal, U.S. Postal Service, USPS gives to people, which is informed delivery. And it allow it allows them it allowed them to get emails with scans of our mail oh like the outside of our mail uh that was like the simplest thing for them to sign up for and then uh once they had that then they stole mail from the mailbox and used that to open a bank account oh my in our name gosh. and my dad's theory was that they would like see if there are any checks coming in steal the checks that were coming uh -huh. to our and mailbox then they have your all your that's the you other that's the, the other account. like really dumb system which is like we mm -hmm. send paper checks to pay people through the mail and the checks all have your like bank account and routing number on them. Yeah. <sighs> people who are not in the U.S. who are listening to this are just like rolling their eyes. Like, really, people? <laughs> like, what year is it? Paper checks? <laughs> I don't get that many, to be honest. I really don't. But like, I, I, I had, guess that was the idea. I had to mail a paper check the other day because my I, I went on vacation with my family and I had to pay my brother for the Airbnb and he doesn't have Venmo and will not get Venmo. And won't sign up for <laughs> won't it. sign up for Venmo because he's worried about the, the amount of personal information he has to give to Venmo in order to create an account. So <laughs> instead, he'd rather you send a piece of paper yes. with all of your bank information <laughs> like, <laughs> through the mail. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I had to call U.S. Bank and say, hey, if there's an account there with my name on it, I didn't open it. And they said, yep, there is one. So they closed it down, reported it. I had to go to all the credit bureaus. Oh There's three God. credit bureaus and report it. I had to put credit freezes on everything. I had to go to the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, oh my and, and report that. Yeah, it's been a whole process. So, And what happens now? Like, you know, like, now you don't have access to your own credit. What happens? Like, how do you continue, like, living life? So when I want to open a new account, I go unfreeze it temporarily open the account once the you know like a new credit card or something like that once that is done then i refreeze it so i have to have there's a login basically to each of the three credit bureaus and once i'm in there you know i can i can it's more or less clicking a button at that point to freeze and thaw i guess so that was uh yeah that's what i was dealing with this weekend lots of fun uh i i, I swear it's me though right now like you're not talking to some imposter uh, if you need to, I can tell you my social security I, number. I feel like I need to like double, like I, I can, we have a secret question that I need to ask you every time I talk to you. Like, okay, is this the real Jamin? Maybe you need to ask me a question that only I, you and I would know, like uh, no imposters could, could jump in. Here. Okay. What's the, what's the first, the city that we first met in person in? So technically it was outside the city, but we were in the Portland airport, Portland, Portland International right. Airport. And we were in the waiting what do you call that the waiting area the lobby no the, the gate, gate. <laughs> we were in the gate at the gate <laughs> uh about to fly to todd's house are you sure that you're really damon <laughs> <laughs> i'm not convinced anymore actually this is probably the best <laughs> confirmation that it's me ever getting all this stuff wrong 
Okay, anyway, uh, you're going to have to accept that it's me. But we were flying to Todd's house and, and, and yeah. doing our first uh, all-team retreat. Yeah, we literally met at the airport. I was like, hey, I, start, I had started my job like a week, a Hi, week prior. I was like, hey, new boss, <laughs> let's get on a plane and fly yeah. to a city to stay at the house of my other new boss. <laughs> <laughs> bizarre. But hey. It, doesn't, it wasn't as weird as it sounds it when you say it like that. <laughs> It was not. It was a really fun uh, retreat. Anyway, I'm Jamin Holmgren. I swear, <laughs> your host, friendly CTO of Infinite Red. I'm not going to give out any more information about myself. Uh, th- that's just backfired on me. Uh, I'm joined by my marvelous, marvelous co-host Robin, who is, oh, I need to update this, now director of engineering at Infinite Red. Congrats, oh, by the way. Oh, thank you. It's, <laughs> it's taking some getting used to your director anywhere near my name. <laughs> You're the best uh, director of engineering we've ever had, though. I will say that. <laughs> we won't tell anybody that I'm the only one you've ever had. <laughs> and I'm also going to skip uh, all the parts. I, this is, I'm really suspicious. I'm really, like, uh, paranoid right now. I'm you just going to say give out that any she lives somewhere. Inf- I live somewhere with somebody. Yeah. Yes. And has worked somewhere <laughs> for the past six years. Don't listen all to right, any this... of the previous episodes where we give out this exact same information. <laughs> yeah. And probably the future ones. <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Infinite Red, which is a premier React Native design and development agency located fully remote in the U.S. and Canada. If you're looking for React Native expertise, hit us up at infinite.red slash React Native. And don't forget to mention that you heard about us through the React Native radio podcast. Uh, We always love seeing that. It does give us a lot of warm fuzzies. All right, let's get into our topic for today. We're going to talk about React Native CI and automated deployments. First up, Robin, what is CI? What does that stand for? Uh, continuous integration, which means something different depending on who you ask. <laughs> yeah, it kind of feels that like that's the case. So we should probably define our terms before yeah. we continue. For, for our purposes. For our purposes, we... mostly, mostly our purposes, also your purposes. But when we say CI, we mean automated processes that allow changes to be integrated regularly with quick detection of issues like linter errors test failures, uh, compiler errors, that kind of thing. Integrated into the sort of release version of the app, right. whatever it Generally is. Generally integrated into the main branch or whatever your releasable branch is. So yeah, assuming that if stuff has passed CI, it is generally releasable. Usually people say CI, CD. What is CD then? So CD is continuous deployment, which is the next step beyond continuous integration. So you integrate your code continuously and then you deploy your code continuously, which is Mm -hmm. you merge it and then ship it to users on that same like regular. Makes sense that they go hand in hand. If everything passes on CI, then it's time to sometimes uh, send it off to users now there might be some sort of an uh, like a manual promotion of that build in you know into users hands because you may want to control that for marketing or or coordination yes. purposes. Yeah, generally I would say most larger companies don't do continuous deployment in the most pure sense of the right. word. They they'll do continuous integration but then they'll to like you said market it and also maybe do some manual QA make th- make sure like everything's smoke tested and and really solid and then do a predictable release schedule rather than just like whenever something is merged so it reminds me of an article that i read probably over a decade ago from etsy.com you know the big like marketplace for crafts and whatnot uh they have a thing where their ci is so bulletproof that they require brand new engineers to deploy to the main etsy.com website on their first day on day one huh? on their first day on the job they have to deploy that's something impressive. yeah it's impressive to feel that confident in your your automated <laughs> processes exactly and so because that's a thing uh they have to make sure that their continuous integration their tests and 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 all of their linting rules and whatever else are give give them the confidence that even a uh you know a brand new developer won't break the site or if it happens then there's an easy way to roll it back i mean so there's this like really common cliche or like saying that developers don't don't deploy on fridays or like don't push to production Mm -hmm. on fridays it's it's kind of a thing it's a meme Mm -hmm. but there's there's people that 
pretty fiercely say, no, if you're afraid to deploy to production on Friday, that means something about your your system and your process right. is, is broken because you, there shouldn't be a fear around deploying to production ever because it, A, it sh- you should have so much confidence because it's been so thoroughly tested that you're not really worried that deploying to production is going to break a bunch of things. And also you should be able to roll back just like almost instantly. So it should be no big deal to deploy to production on Fridays. Mm -hmm. And this kind of goes, goes along with that. Yeah. Like anything, you have to weigh the consequences of being wrong here. Uh, If the consequences are you simply that you notice something's wrong and you click a button and you roll it back really quickly and you're done, like then really nobody's kind of on call too much over the weekend. So fine. But if you are launching rockets then you probably want to make sure you're not just hitting the button, launching the rocket and heading home for the weekend. (laughs) You know, like there's, there's, there's stages, there's, there's phases, there's different types of risk profiles here. So, I mean, that said, like there's, there's differences when we're talking about like web versus mobile apps, like shipping an update to the app store is maybe not quite so rollbackable as Mm -hmm. shipping a new version of a website, which you can roll back like almost instantly so there you have to consider stuff like that also things like data migrations and stuff are harder to roll back uh yeah Mm -hmm. so let's talk about back in the day um now not all the way back to q basic days where i would load the game onto a three and a half inch floppy disc and take it on a boat to my cousin's house (laughs) on the (laughs) island we did an episode where we I mentioned did. that. Most complicated deployment pipeline ever <laughs> involves oars. <laughs> but have you have you worked in an environment that didn't really have like CI in the past? I'm going to say no. I wow, remember okay. it. Be, I mean, because I started coding in 2014. And you worked at professional places, unlike me, where I mm-hmm. just sort of carved out my own company and didn't <laughs> exactly. know what I was doing. I so, mean, I... Yeah. I I started with a company pretty much right out of code school and they used yeah. Jenkins for their yep. CI. Okay. So you've kind of, you've gone through the evolution of like Jenkins way back in the day, the evolution of CI. So this is what, what we used to do back in, back in my day. Uh, okay, grandpa. <laughs> we didn't have CI. We didn't even know there was such a thing as CI. We had a checklist and an expectation that someone was going to run the check, go through the checklist yeah. before they deployed the website so we would build this website and then someone's job was to go through the checklist and be like okay did we make sure that we added you know alt tags to the images and did we you know it's, it was sort of like quality it was quality assurance but it was also like did it break when i was testing it you know going through and, and clicking on things and there were you know like that was fine but once you get to a larger size then you know, you have a larger amount of people working on it. You have more deployments going out. You have a bigger app in general. It becomes very unwieldy to test everything. And so what happens is people, is people will just take shortcuts and not test everything because there's no way they could. And so then you deploy things and then you get broken stuff. And then you start thinking, okay, well, we should probably have tests. You know, we should probably write tests. And so you're writing tests and and then uh, that's fine. But then you have to make sure that someone actually runs the tests before you send it out, you know, on their local machine or maybe on their local machine, you know, it's not set up right or, or whatever. And it's also just really slow. So, you know, because while they're running tests, they can't be doing something else. So instead of running on your local machine, let's just run it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And now you're at, you're at CI. You're at continuous right. integration. And then you make point. a service out of it. And that's where we are today. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So let's bring this to React Native. Uh, Halfway into the episode, let's bring it to React Native. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Classic. It's just, what can we do? <laughs> what does CI look like in our daily workflow? So most of the React Native projects that we do, before we even get to a CI server, all of our projects have prettier set up. And we use VS Code and it all format on save is always turned on. So everyone's like code is pretty much prettier formatted before it even gets to the CI server. So that's kind of step zero. And then there, depending on the project, some people have really strong opinions about this, but there may be Git hooks that run mm-hmm. your suite, your tests, your linter, your compiler before you push the code up or maybe before you commit. I personally think pre-commit is annoying and I only do pre-push because I want to just sort of make mm-hmm. sure everything looks good before I put it in front of people. Yeah. 
What do you do when you have like half finished code and you're done for the day and you just need to get it onto the server? Dash so dash no verify. It? Oh, okay. So you'll I just I just that, will then. skip the hooks if I know okay. it's just throw away or work in progress. So as long as it's okay to run, yeah. no verify. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that just stops it. Just lets you push it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it's like force almost. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's sort of a an honor system thing. Like you're you're trusting mm-hmm. that people won't do they won't skip the git hooks when they're pushing up for a pr but then they'll also like you also add in ci uh actions that run when a pull request is opened or when a branch is pushed so even if they do skip the git hooks then there's another layer of protection because it actually runs the stuff the pre-push hooks are really just for the developer because it's gonna get caught i want to save myself from the embarrassment yeah. of pushing up my PR and having CI fail, being like, yeah. you didn't run your tests b- before <laughs> you pushed the, like, were you even running tests while you were doing that? Like, it's embarrassing. And so I like the pre-push hook to make sure that everything's, yeah. you know, buttoned up before I show people. And that's more just like an ego thing or like a mm-hmm. personal preference thing. But we always have automatic, like, CI server actions run. In Slack? They, there should be an integration that shows each person's current branch and whether CI <laughs> is passing red or green. <laughs> uh, There's probably a plugin for that. Uh, so then you, when you push the pull request or whatever to the server, then it kicks off a process. And this right. can be a number of different services doing this. And yeah. in React Native, uh, we might use something like GitHub Actions or Circle CI, which is my personal favorite, or you know there are a lot of other options yeah. out there. Yeah, some people like Jenkins. Jenkins is a Semaphore. is an older option. It's very DevOps oriented, um, not right. not as user friendly. Mm-hmm. Um, Jamin and I disagree because my personal favorite is GitHub Actions. I just I love how integrated it is with like because yeah it, it's right there in your repo so you don't have to like make github talk to circle ci and vice versa that is a good point the reason i like circle ci is it has this really cool feature where it's probably less it's maybe less useful for react native apps i don't know actually but you can actually like open an ssh uh, session into your build and actually go into the terminal and run your tests manually from your terminal okay, that, in your CI server. I do, I do recall now. I've done that with yeah. CI and it was very helpful. It's it's pretty helpful because like sometimes it's failing. You're like, why is this failing? I have no idea <laughs> I'm why. I'm actually dealing and with that all... right now on a project where my GitHub <laughs> action is failing. It's like choking on yeah. a dependency and won't install it. And I'm like, I don't know how to debug this. That that's <laughs> I think I like the integration. It's more like the debugging experience was so much better on Circle I want CI. The for features me. of Circle CI on github with the integration yeah. of of github actions i spent like two days one time trying to get circle ci to have all the right permissions and stuff to run mm, that is app. annoying where you just ha- you just get that for free with github actions yeah yeah that's fair but yeah tons of options the idea is just something runs a suite of things whenever you push code to the server and this is like pre-merge and then we're assuming once it's merged, it probably also runs to make sure the integrated code also uh, works. Yeah, that's together. a good point. Because like, if something else has been merged in the meantime, maybe there's no Git conflicts, but you merge it in yeah. and then there's an, like a logical conflict or something that really just throws off your your end product. So your tests right. need to run again, make sure that it's all working. Well, and there, there may be an additional set of things that you do on merge. Like maybe you only run your end-to-end test suite on merge because it takes a lot longer and it's more intensive that's true or maybe yeah, you, you deploy, can kind of escalate right exactly that. or maybe you deploy test builds uh that's what we do is when we push to a branch it just runs tests and linter and uh ts compiler mm-hmm. but then on merge uh we actually deploy a, a beta build to users so that's another option it's a lot for react native apps it's a logical co- sort of deployment process where you can deploy this this beta version once it hits your main branch but you're not actually deploying to users right you do that on a little bit more of a manual process where you promote a build to like okay we're gonna we're gonna send this right. out to other users right pushing and pushing to the app store is involved enough that i wouldn't i don't think i would ever feel comfortable doing it on an automated basis because 
with the review process and everything. Right. You wouldn't. I don't. I. Th- I think I would want to control when that happens. Yeah, that's something that web developers ha- don't have to deal with is the review process. <laughs> you could make so. a website of whatever you want and put it on the internet. <laughs> no one's gonna stop Turns you. Out. <laughs> Yeah, uh, internet's a wild place. That's a whole other can of worms. I know there are advocates out there for a uh, like a, a more browser-like experience for mm-hmm. mobile apps, where it's much more open. And but yeah, that's a whole that could be a whole other episode. It could be. <laughs> so then, once you're deploying React, let's talk React Native. Like deploying those automatically. I know that Fastlane is what we really used at the beginning we would we would use fastlane which isn't specifically for react native it it works for really any mobile app no it's it's yeah it's not specifically react native i remember the native engineers at my last company used mm-hmm. fastlane it's just sort of an, an automation tool for ios and android and there's things like fastlane match which allows you to install certificates which is always kind of an annoying thing to do but fastlane match makes it relatively straightforward that's true and then you build you know there's What's Fastlane Jim? Um, Jim is iOS and Gradle is so they the so that's the build those tool. are like the actions that do the build step. I don't know why it's right. called Jim. They, <laughs> like they've, G-Y-M. they've since they've since aliased Gymnasium. it to build iOS because I think no one knew what in the world Jim was. I don't yeah. know. There's got to be a history a story about why it's called that. But right, yeah. So they there's an, there's actions for like actually building the app and then there's actions for like uploading to google play or the apple app store but we don't just use fastlane for the vast majority of our stuff why is that um i mean we used to i will say we definitely used to uh that was our primary way of deploying apps it's um it's a headache there's there's a lot of like things to configure and to get right and like especially when we're talking Mm -hmm. about ci servers you have to make sure you have a Mac machine that has the right mm-hmm. version of Xcode with the right version of like Xcode build tools and the right version of Node and like configure your server to be exactly like your local environment. And then it needs permissions. It needs like right. permissions for the app store. It needs permissions for the, the play store. It needs certificates installed. And like if you're using match, that means it needs permissions to go to GitHub to get the certificates installed in addition to right. the permissions it needs if you're using circle ci in addition to the permissions <laughs> it needs to check out the repo in the first place so you have like two github yeah. repos it's it was a nightmare trying to get we did yeah. i think i did eventually get uh automated builds with fastlane running on circle ci but it was painful yeah and then you know apple changes something yeah. <laughs> uh and it breaks everything or Google Play Store breaks something, uh, and now you have to upgrade Fastlane, and then there's some change. So there, there's definitely a cost, even though it's free, you know, other than the, yes. the App Store fees, which you pay, you pay anyway. Yeah. Uh, but there's a cost in in your time. So if you were valuing your time less, I guess, than the money, then sure, you know, using Fastlane is fine. But if you value your time more. Now we have a bunch of options. So let's run through a few of those options that we have. Uh, let's start with EAS, uh, Expo Application Services. That's uh, our which favorite. I would say generally our favorite. Yeah, this is kind of the thing that we like and to do. And only, only in the last year has that really sort of... Yeah. I mean, it's it's still like in tech terms, relatively new. Um, but once we started using it, it quickly became my favorite because it, it takes care of all the things that were a headache before we started using it on chain react i think first the chain react yeah. app first and we liked that process a lot yep um for me it's like anything else at expo i just like that they're really deeply embedded and invested in the react native ecosystem Absolutely. so someone like circle ci is like oh yeah we should i guess support you know ios and android yeah. like that it's sort of a side thing versus expo is like react native is our thing it is their business it's not like they're a company that does something else that has decided yeah. to use React Native and might abandon ship uh, Airbnb style. Yeah. And Charlie Cheever, who's a friend of mine and one of the founders, I asked him, like, so have you thought about, you know, expanding that to be all iOS apps, all Android apps and stuff? And he's like, well, for right now, we're really focused on React I Native. Love that's that. the thing we really want to focus on. It sounds like that's where they want to be. Feel, so. It feels good to to be a first class citizen 
for something. I mean, usually it's like yeah. iOS and Android SDKs came first, and then somewhere along the line they got around to making a React Native SDK, and it's sort of an afterthought. But yeah, Expo is... It uses Fastlane under the hood. Are there any downsides to EAS that you can think of using um, EAS for your CI CD? I guess you can't really do CI, right? Like it it's doesn't, only for it doesn't deployment. really do your CI. Yeah. I mean, like it it's not running your your tests and stuff. So you still need you need you need yeah. action or or something. Yeah. At least as of now, maybe they're gonna Get, eventually honestly add it. GitHub GitHub Actions plus EAS has been our my at yeah. least go to for the last few projects. Uh, and it's it's really really seamless like there's a there's right. an expo github actions plugin you like kick off your eas builds from github really easily we will link our episode about eas in the show notes we did an episode a while back all about what it does and why it's awesome um if you want to want to know more about that uh and then of course there's there's lots of other options uh an absolute classic microsoft app center i think that's the first one of the first services that we used at Infinite Red, which we used for a long time. It was, um, yeah, yeah. That was that was a that's of course it's very full featured, and I think Firebase is similar, right? Like Google Firebase. Yeah, I I put my I put App Center and Firebase kind of in the same category. They're paid services. They do pre-release testing and distribution. You build on their servers, and then it, the app is distributed through their ecosystem. You're not you're not downloading builds from uh the app store play store you're downloading like you have the firebase what mm-hmm. i think they just call it app distribution app distribution um, yeah and it integrates yeah. with like crashlytics and stuff like that yeah yeah so both of those have very similar feature sets they do but they both as far as i know also use fastlane under the hood so like fastlane yeah. is still like <laughs> the like de facto way yeah. to automate ios and android builds or react right. builds in our case so they would upload it to a service your users can download from directly and uh do they can you then promote to an official store yeah 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 there's ways that you could do that um i haven't done it in a long time but like you you end up with a an artifact binary that you can then move to the stores as you wish there's a few other options i want to mention runway which was a chain react 2023 sponsor and uh runway.team they have uh they have the ability to upload build artifacts and drop that into test flight, play console, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So it really takes you all the way through your your mm-hmm. release through the store and gives you a lot of visibility right. um into your releases. It looks like a really cool service. They have a they have a free version uh as well. I I think does does App Center and Firebase and EAS, I feel like they probably have I think, yeah, well. they all have, like, free yeah. tiers. Yep. Runway has a full suite of tooling, and, yeah, it's, uh, it's again, one of the, another option here uh, for, there, there are reasons to, to use any of these, uh, these, and we don't have time to get into all of that, but, so there's also one called bitrise.io, and that one has, I think it covers everything as well, has all the you know, App Store, Google Play Store integrations. And yeah, whatnot. it's it seems like a non a non expo EAS like parallel. Yeah, there's there's parallels there. It kind of does like it does your builds, it does your code signing, mm-hmm. it does your deploys to the store. Right, so it seems seems pretty fully full featured. Also, a couple of years ago, Apple came out with Xcode Cloud, which integrates into Xcode and allows you to then get some of the you know CI CD pipeline stuff. Uh, within Xcode, and then uh, Google Cloud has a similar offering called Cloud Build, which allows you to build all kinds of different things on it, uh, CI, CD. So each of the app stores has their own options as well. I think generally speaking, if you don't know which one to go with, you know, we we tend to use either EAS or Microsoft App Center, kind of tend to be our go-tos. But the others are totally reasonable as well. There's other options, obviously. So, I, you know, primarily the the takeaway here is we just want people to know that there are options for CI and CD. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have to evaluate them uh, with their pros and cons. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's always it's always a trade off with anything. Oh, yeah. Software engineering seems like. But there's way more options now than there used to be, which is really nice. Yeah. So I think uh, we'll. We'll call that good and uh, wrap this up. Uh, 
yeah. integrated into our reactnativeradio.com we will, we will website and deploy it. <laughs> continuously integrate this episode. Our editors <laughs> wish that it was all automated. <laughs> oh my gosh, wouldn't that be nice? Continuous it would be. integration of podcast. That's the new. We could just deploy it. You know, with with AI, anything seems mm-hmm. possible. So. Yeah, it's not there yet, but we just used it, Jed and Todd AI. Give it 10 years. We'll see. If you'd like to nerd out more about React Native CI and CD, join our Slack community, community.infinite.red. Go into the React Native radio podcast channel and feel free to talk about this episode in there. Uh, we're in those those channels and it's always fun to get some feedback on on what you thought about the episode. Maybe tell us what your favorite CI CD service is. Also, you can find Robin online on Twitter at Robin Heinz. What are you up to on Twitter followers these days? Ooh, that's a good question. Robin. I don't keep super it's super not a close metric track of the, of these things. <laughs> You're over sixteen hundred now, almost seventeen hundred. Oh well yeah. Look at that. Sixteen yeah, sixteen seventy one right now. Maybe it'll be more by the time this comes out. Go follow <laughs> me true. on Twitter. Or thre- I'm on threads too. If Ooh, you want to find me on well. threads. Yeah. I have almost nineteen thousand which it's been a little weird to be honest. Like once you hit that level, I'm not like complaining or anything. Don't don't of get me wrong, not. but you do have to change. Oh my the god, way you being tweet. a celebrity is so <laughs> difficult. Uh, no, not complaining. Why did I make you a director? I, I don't get it. Beats this. me. <laughs> you can find me at Jamin Holmgren. Don't follow me though. Actually, you can. It's fine. Uh, React Native Radio at React Native R D I O. How many? Do we have for that? Oh, ooh, almost ten thousand. Come on, go. How go does follow it, RDIO folks. have more than me? Why are you people going to follow? Mm. Obviously, you guys <laughs> are going to go follow the podcast account and haven't been following me. And it's true. We mention it every episode, but people don't go follow you. Robin underscore Heinz with an E at the end. <laughs> go follow Robin. She tweets once a quarter. No, that's not true. You've been tweeting more lately. Uh, like once, once a week, maybe. If you if more people follow is me, that, maybe I'll tweet more. I don't think that's how that works. You have to tweet more before people. I, that's how I did. I just put out ten thousand tweets, and eventually people are like, "Okay, I'll follow him." <laughs> Thanks to our editor Todd Worth. Sorry about this, Todd and Jed. <laughs> this has been a very choppy episode. I'm sure it'll come out beautifully because of how well they do. Our designer Ju- Justin Husky and our guest coordinator Derek Greenberg, who has been on vacation, and I'm. Really happy you got a vacation, but also really happy he's coming back today. Thanks to our sponsor, Infinite Red. Check us out, infinite.red slash React Native. Thank you all for bearing through this episode. <laughs> <laughs> we we appreciate it, uh, and we'll see you all. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Do you have a mom I joke? do. Um, so this is courtesy of none other than Todd Worth himself. I think he wrote it, so go tweet at him if you don't like it. I was listening to Three Frogs Telling a Story... It was riveting. See, this is why people don't follow you on Twitter. (laughs) We'll see you all next time. Bye.